let, let me start by thanking Open AI Arrow and the Global Congress for the invitation. My presentation examines the meaning of communities and the autonomy with respect to the intellectual property they produce. Generally, I'm interested in the ownership of IP produced by communities because in many ways, the issue of openness and collaboration are closely related to the fact of ownership. One of the unique features of this the excellent book launched at this event are the numerous case studies of diverse IP communities ranging from independent music producers in Egypt, automotive mechanics in Uganda, textile manufacturers in Ghana, leather product manufacturers in Nigeria, and traditional healers in South Africa, analyzed and profiled in different perspectives brought to the question of ownership, openness, and collaboration. One of the key issues I examine is whether these IP communities own the intellectual property they produce. Perhaps the appropriate question is whether our legal systems recognize that communities can own property and further whether they can own intellectual property. This assertion, of course, assumes that we have a settled understanding of communities. How do we recognize and valorize communities who operate on an objective? When do we confer a juridical status on a group of individuals who organize themselves? What objectives are sufficient? Do we consider the informal mechanics in Uganda as important as ethnic groups or as important as the Kalula traditional rulers who, who really are from different ethnic groups but organize around traditional medicine? Contemporary and comparative constitutional design yields three types of communities religious, linguistic, and cultural communities that are considered worthy of protection. But what really do these terms mean? We are often quite sure we recognize a religion easily. After all, no one would doubt Christianity and Islam are religions. But many would scoff at the suggestion that belief systems without creed, canon, or clergy are really religious. This is really traditional African religions. We probably will have no problem identifying linguistic communities. But how do we identify cultural communities if we agree that culture is an abstraction emanating from beliefs, practices, values, shared understandings, and institutions that give members of a community an identity? We will no doubt agree that ethnic indigenous communities are indeed our usual meaning or understanding of a cultural community. If these communities are organized on the basis of blood descent, are they really much different from other individuals organized around other social facts, such as commercial endeavor? How many of us will agree that the artisans working in the informal sector in Uganda or the leather shoe manufacturers in southeastern Nigeria constitute a juridical community? What makes a group of people living together in a closely knit urban environment less of a community than members of an ethnic community dispersed through a country? Should we recognize online communities organized around transactions, interest, fantasy, and relationships? As the internet becomes a cost-efficient means of communication, it is important to understand the challenges for innovation that arise from interactions in such medium. Are we prepared to recognize online communities as juridical entities? Another related challenge to the meaning of communities important for IP is how we assess the membership of intellectual property communities in, in circumstances where individuals and corporate concerns on account of commercial viability are attracted in a way that challenges the makeup of communities. From the Roybos community in the Northern Cape to the Adinkra and Kente producing communities in Ghana, ethnic communities who are engaged in cultural production specific to their geography have drawn in capital and technology that suggest we rethink the boundaries of communities. There is, it would seem, a traditional and a modern robust manufacturing community that stretched back to centuries. To suggest that only this Koi San should be considered the owners of the cultural knowledge of robust production would be to lose sight of the enormous financial, cultural, and scientific investment into a product that has become a South African icon. Obviously, multiple robust communities have a mind that need more thinking. We may need to ask in this regard how pure 
ethnic communities must remain to sustain their legitimacy. We should be reminded that, that some of the intractable problems in this area are there to see when we review how nations have dealt with who citizens, who their citizens are. Can communities own property and can they own what I, I call communal intellectual property? This question is important because it appears that the recognition of the ownership of communities could be related to the incentives for innovation as well as identity formation that is important for members of this community. I suggest also that unless questions of ownership are resolved, it may be difficult to fully appreciate the ramifications of openness and collaboration. For example, the tendency to ascribe openness to communities may not fully recognize that such apparent transactional disposition is out of the abundance of the will of the community, which, of course, can change in due course. The concept of ownership explores and affirms social and legal relationship between objects and persons, ranging from the possibility of exclusion to affirmation of moral rights. A satisfactory arrangement is where a legal system recognizes what a person or a community recognizes. Communities develop norms that mediate relationship of members and third parties to her objects. It is satisfactory when a legal system and a community recognizes a relationship between an object and a person. On the other hand, it's also possible that the community's legal order can recognize these relationships even when the state does not recognize such a relationship. The manner in which the legal orders of semi-autonomous entities in a state interact with the state legal system is often described as legal pluralism. Strong legal pluralism recognizes the legal orders of semi-autonomous entities as coexisting often as equals with other legal orders, Why weak legal pluralism incorporates different legal orders within a legal system, and often uses the legal system as a means of recognition and application of the legal orders of the semi-autonomous entities. Why the customary law of ethnic communities in many states interacts with the state legal system in a strong pluralistic way, other communities interact in opposite ways that leaves the recognition of, the, of their normative orders at the mercy of the state formal legal system. Obviously, the legal orders of non-ethnic communities interact in a weak way. These two means of interaction of IP communities has great significance for communal intellectual property. Weak legal pluralism for many IP communities results in a situation where communities are, in most cases, not recognized as owners of their IP. Where, because of legal, deep legal pluralism, it will appear that communities are recognized as owners of intellectual property. Other mechanisms come into play to attenuate the incidence of this ownership. Two broad categories of African states can be identified in the way they treat the ownership of communal intellectual property. The vast number of African states regard communal intellectual property as part of the common cultural heritage to be managed by the state. In many of these states, the juridical status of communities is doubtful. Across sub-Saharan Africa, the dismal record of the protection of expressions of folklore is traceable to this disconnect between ownership and control. The other tiny group of African states in their national constitutions recognize communities as legal constructs but seem unable to properly manifest this recognition. Two examples are sufficient to illustrate this point. First, South Africa, where the raging controversy over the best way to protect expressions of folklore is in reality a, a disagreement on the nature and extent of the ownership of communal and intellectual property. Should we allow communities to exercise acts of ownership over their IP or should we do it on their behalf? Even with the recognition of traditional religious and cultural communities in the 1996 South African Constitution, as well as an enhanced status of customary law, one gets the feeling of a legal system uneasy about group rights, perhaps for understandable reasons. Many would agree that except for black ethnic communities, group rights are seen through an individual prism in South Africa. The possibility that the laws, norms, and protocols that govern the interaction of non-ethnic communities and their intellectual property would not be recognized by the South African legal system is high. It is doubtful whether communal intellectual property would qualify as constitutional property in section 25 of the 1996 constitution. The second example is Kenya. 
Of all the constitutions, of all, Af of all African constitutions, it can be argued strenuously that the Kenyan constitution recognizes group rights and a special place for communities. First, Section 11 of the 2010 Constitution recognizes culture as the foundation of the nation and is the cumulative civilization of the Kenyan people and requires the state to promote the intellectual property rights of the, Ke of the people of Kenya. The same section enjoins Parliament to enact legislation first to ensure communities receive compensation of royalties for use of their cultures and cultural heritage, and secondly, to recognize the, and protect ownership of indigenous seeds and play, plant varieties, their genetic and diverse characteristics, and their use by communities in Kenya. Article 40, 45 of that constitution further provides that the state shall support, promote, and protect the IP rights of the people of Kenya. What understanding of a community runs through the Kenyan constitution? Just as the constitution does not define culture, it does not define communities but recognizes marginalized communities as inclusive of indigenous peoples, traditional communities, pastoral persons and communities, as well as communities living at the fringe of the Kenyan society. It is clear that ethnic communities are the heart of the meaning of communities in the Kenyan constitution. However, communities are social constructs, such that ethnic communities organized around blood or descent are not intrinsically more important than communities organized around other social facts, such as geographical contiguity, online perspectives, and commercial endeavors. There is no implicit association of culture with ethnicity. Indeed, the Kenyan constitution uses the term cultural communities, which in some way begs the question. Be that as it may, one hopes that the imagined legal framework for the protection of traditional knowledge in Kenya recognizes the corporate status of at least ethnic communities and puts them at the center of the protection why the state continues to be the regulator and arbiter in the field. Is it not possible to imagine what the scenario of the nationalization of all intellectual property and its effect on innovation will occur when, in places like Kenya and other African countries, the state nationalizes common and cultural intellectual property? To end, it is interesting to note that one of the three future scenarios of the Open AI Arrow project is wireless engagement, recognizing the importance of the internet as the most powerful uh, infrastructure. It is important that African online IP communities that emerge from this infrastructure should be recognized. Are legal systems able to process the IP that emerges from this community? Are we sure we will not be poorer because of the difficulty of imagining communities as more than ethnic communities? Can these communities thrive without the recognition of their legal orders? and the spectrum of ownership rights that they may seek to exercise. It is clear that communities will collaborate and be open at least to have members. It is possible also to argue that their recognition by the state formal systems as semi-autonomous entities would enhance collaboration and openness. Thank you. <laughs>